Hello viewers, it's a continuation of the special series of lectures from Rajendra Mr. School of Engineering Entrepreneurship, IIT Kharagpur. The topic is on product innovation opportunity generated by the present ongoing pandemic COVID. Now like the world war, the COVID-19 pandemic is a severe economic burden for the humankind. It is also an eye-opener for the entire civilization. Its profound influence has largely impacted the day-to-day -day activities and behavioral patterns of the people as can be seen from the change in our lifestyle like use of face, regular use of face masks, the personal protection equipment, hand gloves, sanitizers, uh, maintaining social distancing, doing all physical activities, so on and so forth. We are not sure about the future. We, to be truly uh, in all sense live in the present now. Now this particular lecture will try to address the innovations that will be required to match the change in lifestyles and the changed behavioral patterns of the humankind to match the new normal. In the, in the topic itself, there are two important terms. One is the product, another is innovation. Now, let's go into the uh, individual meaning of the two terms, product and innovation. Now, if when we talk of products, we generally try to define product as a set of attributes offered to customers or users to fulfill their needs or requirements. Now, products can be of various types. It can be tangible product. There can be non-intangible product. Uh, for example, when we when we build a car, we can uh, it's a tangible product. We can feel it. We can we can touch it. We can drive it. When it goes to a service product like a nurse giving service to a patient, or a or a say uh, air hostess uh, giving a service to the passengers in the airplane, the it's also a product. It's a, it's a service product, but it's a intangible product. Product can also be classified as consumer product and industrial product. Now, what are consumer products, what are industrial products that I think people know? People, uh, I mean, the products which are used for personal use, they are basically, or uh, personal consumption, how they consume consumer products, and which will go in mass in organizations that are industrial products. Now, some products are also common to both, like. Uh, like computers, when you sell a, a personal computer, or you, when you buy a personal computer on your own, you are, it is a consumer product. And when thousands of computers get sell, sold to, say, Indian railways, it becomes an industrial product. So um, it can be true, but but again, the the pricing strategies and uh, other things of the same product with same configuration might be different for the manufacturer. So that's why products are classified also like that, and. Uh, we uh, we try to develop products to match the the consumer or the or the customer's requirements. Now the second term is the innovation. Now what is innovation? Uh, I, I saw in the in in the I think in the first lecture that there was a confusion of uh, between innovation and uh, high level higher level of innovation like creativity or invention. Uh, people were asking questions. Now, the, the, when we talk of innovation, we, we just tell it just to renew. I mean, there should not be any, any doubt on that part. It is just to renew and innovation is just adding something new to an existing product or process. Uh, now, uh, it, it basically, uh, when, we, when we tell that we innovate, we have innovated something, we, we innovate on what already exists. 
So, innovation is the change, modification or improvement of an existing product. Now, innovation can be classified into various types. I mean, we cannot, we should not try to go into details from smaller innovation like simple style change of a product to a bigger set of innovation like the, the highest type as creativity or invention. But uh, let us uh, talk of only two major, uh, two types of innovation uh, that we will be discussing more. One is uh, market pool innovation that is basically where the market drives the innovation. Here uh, one basically looks at, looks for the best way of uh, satisfying a newly emerging customer demand and the improvement of the existing products, extension of the existing offer or say even decrease or in price. Uh, it also can involve like, like impulses for uh, continuous incremental innovations or for process innovation. I mean, I mean manufacturing process innovation, whatever is going on, we just make a small tinkering of the process, we, I mean generally uh, it goes and, and market pulls the product. So, so it is basically market driven innovation or market pool. Now, another second type of innovation is the research and development push, where actually the, the company has, has uh, uh, spent a lot of money in uh, doing basic research and developing a particular product and they are looking for the commercial use of new impulses resulting from these, uh, from the derived results. And this actually generate new markets for conceptually different products. And this sometimes brings, uh, uh, bring in what we call disruptive innovation. So, the first type of innovation is majorly sustaining and the second type of innovation where the R&D basically drives the innovation, we generally, generally, I mean not in all cases, but in most of the cases it is uh, disruptive innovation. Now, when we talk of sources of innovation for a company, uh, we always talk of uh, various sources like internal sources, uh, external sources. Um, which can include many things like you can you can you can feel from common sense like your own uh, feedback from your own research and development centers, uh, the technical division, uh, design, technology, production divisions, uh, then uh, production provisions of services, marketing and sales, logistics, uh, which includes uh, uh, the purchases and the sales. Uh, then you have the guarantee and the post guarantee service owner so many i mean you, you can i mean i can give you the end, endless list now there are also some external sources of innovation like the customer whom you are selling they, they give you a feedback of the product how good it is or where actually they require uh, they, they are still feeling a pain or they require some improvement so that basically comes directly from the customer the most sensible type of uh, feedback the competitors come basically by uh, analysis of competitor's product. Uh, then you have lots of consultants who also gives you ideas. So, they, they are uh, external sources. Then you have uh, R&D institutions, general R&D institutions who develop products for many, I mean who do uh, research uh, on, uh, I mean on request on uh, when you provide money for them to them for doing some basic research for you, you outsource them as, as your research center. So, they are basically the R&D institutions. You have the schools, the education institutions, the schools, universities. You have uh, professional publications, patents, internet, exhibitions, fairs, uh, specialized uh, seminars, conferences, advertising agencies, investors, uh, media, so on and so forth. I mean, so many types of uh, sources of innovation, but they, they actually uh, give you the right feedback uh, on which you basically build your own product. So, uh, this is uh, how the innovation goes on. Now, when, when we talk of a product innovation, the typical uh, flow chart of uh, this product inno innovation process, it looks like this. The center part that is the, this, this marketing guide. They basically uh, uh, capture the, the customer inputs, 
customer expectations. They, they, they try to understand the commercial structure that the product is working in, 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 in the market. They do a product pricing to understand that, uh, uh, I mean, to what extent or where actually to fit the product in the market. Uh, they also take care of market introduction, of course, that after developing or in most of the cases while developing the product itself, they start advertising and market introduction of the product. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, they, they, they collect the customer feedback uh, when the product fails or even before failure, uh, even before failure, how it's performing and uh, based on that, uh, again, the the information is given to the concerned department for further development. Now, this marketing department, after doing so many types of activities, they basically collect all the information and pass on to the two major departments. One is the product design, and another is the operational management. Now, this operational management guys, they are basically the the management, uh, the top bosses. They basically look into the the managerial aspect, that is the planning, resource resource management, I mean, resource in terms of human beings, how, how many people they will uh, they will try to put in the product, uh, in the particular project, or how much time for an individual uh, uh, they will be giving uh, uh, in for participation for the new product development, uh, how to manage the risk if it fails, if it earns a bad name. So that part actually, uh, risk can be of various different types, I mean, we will not go into details, but uh, but any sort of risk that comes on, uh, it may be safety or any other risk, uh, earning a bad name for the product also, that is basically managed by this operational management group. Uh, and uh, they also monitor the progress control. But resource management also involves the uh, monetary part, that is, that is the uh, where from to get the money or how much money to be allotted to a particular project. Now, in most of the cases, the, a company never works with one particular project. They actually come up with a, with a, with a uh, set of projects and they try to develop a portfolio of products. And here again, the, the role of the higher management comes in in a big way that they basically decide on how much money, how much manning, how much time to put on each and every product. product uh, when exactly to launch each product in the market, the time of launch, when to withdraw a particular product running, I mean so many things, they are basically uh, taken care by the operational management team. And when it comes to the product design part, yes, that's the fundamental thing of the getting the market data, that's the raw data, in terms of customer feedback, in terms of just layman's language. The, the team decides, the market uh, design team, they decide what is actually needed. I mean, what, what do they need to develop uh, and the specification. That means to, to convert the, the, the qualitative language of, the, of a customer. I mean, for example, some customer may tell, uh, look, say, I'm not happy with the color of, the, of this particular material. So now, what color it will be? That will be decided. That has to be specified. Uh, unless you specify it, you cannot develop that. Or you can. Somebody can say that that uh, the seat of uh, this particular vehicle I don't like. I'm not very comfortable with. Now, what is the meaning of this comfort? That that to uh, to derive this word comfort into numbers, into numbers, uh, matrices along with the units. That's basically the job of the engineers and the scientists who develop the specifications for the particular product. And then it's a design. Design means it's just how to realize, the process of realizing it. I mean, what type of drawing to do uh, uh, and uh, how, how to, uh, and what type of material to be chosen uh, to attain those specifications, what angles to be given. I mean, so many, the, the, the nitty gritties of design, what we tell, it, it, it can be it's from material as to till the uh, final drawing. Then you have the verification, that is the uh, one to develop it or not completely, the partial, after even after the partial development of that, you require to verify. So whether even the partially developed product is meeting the specifications or not following the uh, design attributes. 
Now then you have the engineering team, which is very, very important, which um, the, it is easy for the big company to do, but it's difficult for the, for the uh, entrepreneurs or the people who are new in the field or new in the game to do, to understand that how to produce and maintain. It's very easy to develop a product because uh, knowledge is available now. In, 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 it's almost an open source. And uh, so many people are will be there with knowledge to help you out uh, in getting a particular product made. But ultimately, uh, it boils down to how you produce and maintain. Maintain means the same quality. Does you have to produce the same quality of product again and again, uh, keeping to the specifications that you have promised to your customer. In case of uh, in case of uh, safety products or products which are uh, I mean which are related to the safety aspects uh, for pharmaceutical industry, uh, this is much more critical because uh, if anything goes wrong with the with the uh, quality of the product, then you have uh, I, I mean the people the customers will have to pay a big uh, I mean very heavily actually on that. So. So uh, this is what uh, is the, the engineering guys have to do to, to take the product of from the R&D center to the pilot plant and finally to the production unit uh, and ultimately they will try to maintain the specifications uh, intact which were pre-designed, the pre-designed specifications intact. And then you have the final that is the venue after you launch the particular product in the market you, have, you need to monitor the HMES. That is a failure mode and effect analysis. Now, why it has failed? Now, now product can fail uh, after the warranty period. Product can even fail uh, before the warranty period. Now, both the uh, reasons need to be known. Uh, why it's important? Because then only you can uh, develop the next, you know, uh, next phase of product or improve on the whatever is existing. So uh, this design team, I mean, when uh, when they get, get I mean, get this FMEs, the failure mode, uh, and uh, after doing the analysis of the failed products, they actually again give back the knowledge uh, or the information to the design team, so that again they start redesigning it and re-realizing uh, the uh, the new set of products. Now, when we talk of generic product development process. Uh, which we basically uh, take up in the class, it consists of a uh, few uh, phases, stages and gets we, we tell. It starts with the planning, which we generally keep outside the product development process. Then the concept development, followed by system level design, and then detailed design, and then you have uh, testing and refinement, and production ramp up. So, so here you see the, uh, in this, uh, between every stage, there are gaps. Now, what are these, uh, the function of the gaps is you have generally brainstorming uh, sessions uh, uh, in the, within the industry to understand that whether to go forward with, with, your, uh, with the next step or not. Because you, you will not allow uh, good money to uh, run after uh, or to chase a bad money uh, in, in manufacturing. So, so uh, in, in at say any stage like concept development phase, if they realize that no, this is uh, not really going to give a uh, lot of benefit to the, or not really going to give uh, what the customers want, then it's better to drop it and try for something else. So, so this, these are the that's why the every the gets are there in between all the stages, and these are the outputs from each get. So the, the planning. Uh, stage gives rise to mission approval, concept development gives rise to concept review, system level design gives rise to system specification uh, with review, detailed design gives critical design review, testing and refinement gives the production approval and ultimately uh, this actually shows that in every stage you are basically bringing down the risk, it's narrowing down the risk of an organization. It's a, for, a, for a product also it's true, for an organization also it's true. I mean as you, as you go along the different stages and uh, exploring the different stages and um, trying to examine the outputs at each get uh, and solving them, you are basically 
uh, trying to minimize the risk factor uh, of the management of the organization of the particular product. Now, this generic product um, uh, process uh, with these stages and gets is well structured and generally it's taught in the class of product development. Uh, uh, but for product types, the, of course, the sequence changes. For example, uh, if we take a quick build product like a software product, where uh, you can multiple time you can you can do you know uh, the build build or uh, write the software and test it. There, you know, you have to go for multiple iterations after this detailed design and testing and refinement. But if you go for building a complex product, for example, from like like a, like a submarine, like a uh, like an aeroplane, we, which actually uh, requires lots of uh, small parts. I mean, lots of parts, small parts are involved in the manufacturing of this or in the design of the big product. Uh, uh, which we call basically a complex product. So there, this testing and refinement will just go, be, uh, I mean, before uh, detailed design in a big way because the system level design has to be approved first. It has to be um, made almost 100% sure before you go to the detailed design or, and, the, and the assembly part because once you have assembled it to a big one, there is no, almost no scope of testing and uh, I mean refinement because uh, you have already, uh, I mean, Put a lot of money and effort uh, for this. So, so this uh, it, it it actually varies uh, or actually changes from uh, product to product. But this is the generic product development now uh, process. Now, uh, whatever we have told you about the uh, sources of innovation, that has been very nicely put forward by uh, Peter Drucker. Drucker uh, in his book uh, Innovation and Entrepreneurship, where he has mentioned the seven sources of innovation in parcel. Now, he has uh, distinctly made a difference uh, between uh, internal and external source. Now, you see that how beautifully it matches the today's situation. Now, this book he has written in 1985, and all this, um, these uh, Examples or the sources which have or the classifications he has made are basically based on uh, the world wars. His uh, whatever he has experienced with the world wars and with different com com companies, he has come up with. Um, I mean, each as a source. So one is unexpected event. Now this unexpected event consists of unexpected success. It can be unexpected failure. It can be an, even an unexpected outside event. You just follow his, his this terminology and you can always uh, uh, get hold of this book. It, it's uh, actually available in the net also, uh, PDF you can download. It's a beautiful book to be read. Uh, you can, anybody can read it anytime. It's uh, beautifully written. Uh, the second one is incongruity or contradiction. Now this basically deals with the non-compliance part. Now this, uh, it can be uh, four types of non-compliance. One is non-compliance between um, uh, with the uh, say economic reality. Number two can be contradiction between reality and the anticipations about it. Number three, it can be contradiction between the anticipated and real behavior of customers and their values. And the last is in congruity or non compliance within the rhythm or logic of an ongoing process. So if somebody has found this type of incongruities, he has enough reason to build a product and he has enough uh, fruits to build a particular product or data to build a particular product. So the third type of in-ground congruity is, uh, or uh, sorry, the source is a process need. Uh, there's a third one. Uh, it, it basically uh, matches to some extent with the uh, last incongruous part that is the rhythm or logic of a process. But process need basically deals uh, with the realization um, or to realize the necessity of change, identify the weak points in a particular chain. It can be any chain, in a, uh, I mean, any logistic chain also. Or <coughs> uh, the process need can arise, uh, I mean, if one be convinced that if something does not work the way um, it should, then it is necessary to attempt a change. Uh, there is a process need when the solution must be convenient for those who will implement it. 
it must place moderate and feasible requirements in place. So this this is basically the process needs of an existing manufacturing process. If there is a need, there is a scope for of, of innovation. Now there is the change in structure of industry or market. So here the, uh, it can happen due to rapid growth of uh, of any industry, and um, uh, it can also uh, take place if uh, the time the um, say um, uh, identification uh, of a new say market segment uh, suddenly I, I mean after world war there are different classes of people which were actually coming up the middle class upper middle class lower middle class that type of segmentation of uh, people who actually evolved during that time so so new new market segments start, started uh, appearing so from there actually P uh, Peter Drucker uh, suggested this um, change in structure of industrial market. Uh, convergence of technologies, uh, for example, uh, uh, I mean, you can get lots of examples. I mean, now actually many technologies are converging to get a particular product, digital technology along with the communication technology giving rise to the modern smart home, so on and so forth. I mean, there's lots. Uh, then, then you have rapid change of the industry and resulting need of a uh, structural change. Now you have a, then you have a set of three external sources are from Drucker. One is of course the demographic changes. Now that basically uh, uh, deals with the, or it's rather, rather very easy, uh, easiest to describe and to predict. Now uh, it, uh, the, the influence, uh, what will be bought and who and in what amounts will purchase, that basically will, um, will be de decided by the demography. Uh, he has actually in his book he has exclusively given example of each example with multiple small stories which are really uh, people will enjoy to go through. Uh, then you have um, the change in world view what we call uh, what actually he has coined as like it's a, it's a change in approach to health. For example, uh, people were, people I mean are too much concerned about their health for the past few years. It can be any healthcare, starting from food to spending few hours of uh, leisure time, walking, gym, gymnasium, uh, uh, dresses. I mean, so many things related to health. So this is uh, there is if there is a change in approach to health itself. I mean, that itself is a source, external source, uh, regarded by Drucker. Uh, then you you have uh, uh, say, for example, the upper middle class. Uh, they will get a chance to offer non-standard services at non-standard prices. So, uh, I mean, when this upper middle class came up, actually, after uh, after the World War, uh, uh, this, I mean, I mean, the, the inflation of prices by some companies for some products, actually, it started. Then you have uh, uh, increasing migration, migration, feminism, regionalism, so many things. Uh, but the timing is essential uh, to be fast in the market. For example, in, even in launching the health magazines and all, we can see now that the timing is so, you know, so uh, so important. First to market is actually very important. Then you have new knowledge. I mean, this is actually the uh, almost uh, the highest level of innovation that we have talked about, uh, based on convergence and synergy of uh, kinds of knowledge. Actually, what he has suggested that when a new idea comes uh, to there to a particular product based on non, uh, new knowledge, it takes the maximum time. Time to market is maximum here. So now, uh, so with these sources of innovation, you can you can easily find out that this COVID-19 has given up in our enough sources. Uh, uh, you can you can trace it actually one is to one uh, from darker sources that COVID-19 has forced human preferences shift towards certain things. Now what it has changed is that now the, our preferences are shifted towards a few, the public safety and security. It is very important, which we never used to bother before. Then it's modernizing the healthcare. Now this also we have seen from our experience of uh, different governments working that the healthcare is uh, not really in a very good shape and it re really requires a lot of revamping. Is a disaster prevention. 
this uh, will become or people have become concerned with. Then your manufacturing and supply chain, I think uh, uh, we have our speakers also here to speak on this. And your sustainable energy fuels, which one can afford to wear. We are seeing, we are seeing, um, uh, I mean, so many barrels of, uh, of oil floating on the sea uh, during this, all the, uh, uh, during the lockdown period. All the petrol pumps were uh, almost shut down. There was no use of, use of uh, oil. The oil price almost went to zero. Even people were uh, thinking of negative. So, so these things happened during COVID-19. And that is why we have learned and our preferences have, have shifted towards certain things which were not there in, each, uh, in our list, our preferential list uh, uh, before. So in one word, we can see that a virtual world is slowly getting evolved. It is, it is expanding fast. As we can see uh, from the regularization of the online classes, uh, at all levels, school, college, universities, everywhere. Introduction of robots, uh, many, of many businesses have either shut down or changed to accommodate social distancing. New patterns of consumer and worker behavior expectations have emerged during the initial weeks of uh, this crisis. So today, human preferences basically have shifted towards a virtual world which is still trying to accommodate the threshold economic activity for sustenance, just for sustenance, nothing else. I mean, people are not expecting very big things in their life now. They, I mean, so what we feel is that uh, we are lucky enough if we survive this pandemic. So how to survive this pandemic? And, and the pandemic, the survival strategies of the pandemic has given rise to certain products which uh, we'll be discussing now. Now in this public safety and security, which we told was one of the preferences now people have shifted uh, towards. Now it is very important uh, that in um, the products which they can make for this purpose, the customers are ready to pay for safety features now. This is very important, which we are not. I mean, uh, at one point of time, even, even, I mean, just, I mean, not from this COVID experience, but airbags were just, uh, you know, uh, toys uh, in, the, in the vehicles. Uh, you, you can either, either buy that version, go for that version, or may not be. But nowadays, all the, almost all the vehicles, uh, they are, uh, I mean, uh, airbags are provided with the, with the vehicle, new vehicles. And this from the experience that where the, the, the accidents are happening too frequently. So the, the customers are now ready to pay for the safety features they want to leave. Quality of safety features are primary to the quality of the product. Organizations are trying to build products to mitigate risk. So risk and risk management, these things are in the brain of the common people, of the manufacturers, and they are now considering including safety features in a product which could Otherwise, it would have been very difficult for them to introduce. So now, when we talk of uh, this domain, public safety security, now what are the scopes of innovation and entrepreneurship? In it? What the, our young blood can go for making a particular product or which type of products they can try to develop? One is a disposable and reusable personal protection equipment. The second one, disposable and reusable face mask. Then you have gloves, you have shoe covers, you have head covers, you have aprons, and food packaging, which is very important nowadays because of, again, from, you know, so that the food you getting delivered in your house or home is free from the virus. Now, this PPEs, face mask, not the PPEs I will tell, but, but the face mask, gloves, shoe cover, head cover, they are available everywhere. But the question is, what is the quality? More than that, what is a matter of concern, I, I mean, that's my way of looking at it, is where to dump them. Because most of them, they are making disposable. Reusables are very few. So if the reusables are very few, disposables are too high, that opens up a new field 
of waste management in a very very big way where people will be using so many face masks disposable face masks disposable gloves disposable ppes or disposable shoe cover where to throw them how to how to uh, clean them or how to get the raw material back from them if at all possible or if the raw material is not i mean it's not possible to get the raw material what to do with them so that it doesn't cause uh, uh, or cause to be a public hazard in a, any any sense so here for example i will take one uh, small example uh, in this aspect uh, to uh, i mean uh, tell you the importance of product development or how to proceed with that now for example one wishes to make disposable and reusable ppe now these are the one so so completely covered partially covered you can see in lot of uh, pictures yeah, nowadays it's it's available in the net and everywhere so in selecting this gown or we call coveralls further consideration should be given to the physical characteristic of the working environment and the specific activities of the healthcare worker now different physical conditions where these gowns or coveralls are used can compromise their material and properties of seam barriers now seam barriers are very important because where the two parts actually meet it's it, that that's the place where actually any leakage can happen so those the barriers become very important and filling of them uh the you know certain actions including say kneeling down or leaning for example for a doctor kneeling down or checking a patient leaning or checking a patient uh, on a chair or a table which is contaminated with blood or whatever it is uh, can result in pressure level that exceeds the levels used in standard test methods for these uh, coveralls and this what will happen ultimately the gowns and coveralls may no longer provide expected levels of protection under these conditions so 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 manufacturing of these is not really very very easy job but it is not very difficult also but one thing we have to be very cautious is we have to abide by the standards which is laid which are laid down now the united states common commonly use the uh, uh what they call ASTM is the American Society of Testing and Materials and the European Society they basically use the organization for standardization that is the ISO method and the CDC that Centers for Disease Control and Prevention they basically lay down the quality characteristics but uh, the C for the PPEs gloves whatever it is now if we see this compliant this quality characteristics of PPEs first of all it has to comply with the regulatory agencies that is very very important whatever they have laid down it has to meet those or it has to comply by that second one is the durability that is the mechanical properties the abrasion resistance tensile strength seam strength so on and so forth comfort very important for the person who is working otherwise you can it cannot make him or her use it that means it has to breathe it has to protect you against the virus or the fluid but it i mean there should be air permeability so that there is i mean air circulation is there and you feel comfortable at the end of that flammability electrostatic properties it should not hold charges it should not hold flame the cost should be reasonable nowadays even in private hospitals uh, what we are seeing is each patient who is getting admitted is charged on the pp used by doctor for investigating him uh, and and the cost is reasonably high i mean that cannot continue we have to uh, come to a cost which is reasonable and uh, easy for the common man to pay uh, then you have the availability part it should be easily available and ergonomics and human factors is very important so integration with other ppes because say for example you you're wearing one cap and another say coverall but that has the, the two seams have to match and uh, the material cannot be such that that if you put a seam tape that the the it cannot uh, i mean it will not uh, stick to the both both of them so integration with other types of pps also need to be uh, checked when we develop this particular pp 
Now, what are the reasons or the excuses that uh, that basically the uh, doctors give or the users give when they actually don't want to use a PC? We have to know that. I mean, that's basically the customer feedback. One is it's, it's too hot; it cannot be used. Secondly, it's poor, poorly fitting. Thirdly, it looks unattractive, uh, not easily accessible, and of course the price part. Now, when you develop a particular product, you uh, you first try to make the the quality function deployment, the house of quality. I mean that is the starting point, which uh, sometimes and, and it's not taught in all the institutes uh, for all the. Of course, in management it is taught, but at graduation level for engineering students, it's not taken up. But it is important, very important to know for entrepreneurs who want to buy, build a new product, that that this QFD has to be implemented from the first day, if not from the zero day. Now here, what the customer wants, this part. Here actually what I told that the too hot, poor feet, this, this types of things, the customer voice has to come in. And here, how to satisfy customer wants, you have to write the technical attributes. For example, what type of textile to be used uh, or what type of angles to be given near the elbow, what type of angles to be given at elsewhere position. Uh, for in any, I mean, the, if, if you use a, uh, any polymer, whether to give any coating for over that to make it, um, uh, I mean, electrostatically blind. I mean, so many things, uh, uh, those things are basically, those attributes are called the techn technical attributes, they are basically put here, how to sat satisfy these customer wants. And here the interrelationship between these customer wants basically takes place. So where the interaction, the customer wants interact very, very uh, majorly, there we give higher numbers and where they interact loosely, we give lower numbers. So this is called the inter interrelationship matrix. And here you have the relationship matrix, relationship back matrix between the uh, technical attributes and what the customer wants. Now here the customer importance ratings also we provide because sometimes we uh, for example, if customer wants five or six things, we cannot give it same importance. We we have to prioritize that which one we will make it for now, or which two or three parts. For example, safety. If any safety aspect is there, that has to be given first uh, preference. Uh, if cost aspect is there, it has to be given higher preference. Uh, if there is a design, for example, color aspect is there. I mean, then of course it can take a. Uh, I mean lower position when it comes to making this types of PCs. So now the, this multiplication or this customer importance ratings will have a value, this relationship matrix is a value, the multiplication will have this weighted rating and then we set up the target values and we have the technical evaluation and here we have to make the competitive assessment based on each customer one, which customer one, which competitor is doing in what way. Now here for making PCs because PCs are not available in India and whatever is being manufactured, we really do not know of the uh, quality they are being uh, done. But definitely it is a very sensitive item to be made and we really require good entrepreneurs to jump into this particular endeavor. For example, uh, this for specification of impermeable and fluid resistant gowns and coveralls, these are the specifications. Uh, given by this one is impermeable, this ISO uh, 16604, so the, the pressure is four, greater than or equal to 14 kPa and this is uh, with less, here is the fluid resistant only. So uh, uh, this is uh, testing done, uh, has to be certified by a third party like uh, 17025, uh, ISO 17025, it has to match uh, uh, this particular specification. Also, uh, these are the standard test methods to evaluate the resistance of the fabrics uh, to synthetic blood and virus penetration. So, this uh, this you can find, the, the references are given here. You can get a lot of details about the specifications which are already there and these specifications are important. Why? Because they are uh, related to the health, not only health, not only safety, to life and death of the individual who is using it. So, we have to take utmost care 
but there is a lot of scope to manufacture this in India. You require these in huge numbers, crores and crores and crores, hundreds of crores, because say face masks, people will be using, people, each individual will be buying in few numbers, because they, they need to wash it, they have to wear it for two to three hours and wash it. I mean that is a lifestyle change or changes or goes in that particular direction. So head covers, face covers, your shoes, in huge numbers you have to produce. So, so uh, we really don't have manufacturers to in that extent, to that scale. So here is the scope you can go for making it. Now in the healthcare domain, now as the world is moving towards a, di a digital world, uh, this healthcare we are seeing is a is in a constant state of flux. As these new diseases emerge, the entire industry must adapt and evolve. Technology always plays a vital role in this evolutionary process and over the last few decades we have witnessed the introduction of many cutting edge machines and processes which are, which are introduced in uh, medical science uh, or which have uh, become the main tools of the doctors. The foremost thing that the healthcare sector must deal with before embracing this healthcare computing storage and safety uh, is the compliance and security. This patient data which uh, will be applied cloud computed is extremely sensitive and with utmost levels of pri privacy it has to be man uh, maintained. Then you have the primary and community health services. Now this uh, the primary health care service in India we have seen uh, during this uh, COVID is grossly neglected in many of the places. I will not tell throughout the country but in most of the places. Now this primary health care should provide low cost, easily accessible care with uniformity in quality. This is very important uh, throughout the country, quality and coordination and uh, they can bring in a radical change in the organization of primary and community health service. So uh, this service is very important and the youngsters can go for this particular venture. They have to take or they have to rope in rather the local point panchayat, the municipalities, the local healthcare or professionals along with local nurses because they are going to play a pivotal role in the future in delivering the community services and entrepreneurs have a large role to play in this particular endeavor. Now this primary uh, care group should play a vital part in overcoming the variability, the fragmentation, isolation that have been the weakness of primary health care in our country. Uh, <coughs> then you have the existing hospital infrastructure which needs, needs to be uh, revamped again because uh, most of the hospitals they are now full filled with uh, COVID patients and normal patients are not getting uh, enough uh, uh, justice when they go there. Uh, you know, the attention of the doctors are diverted towards the COVID patients mostly. So, so that but this should not happen. So the existing hospital infrastructure needs to be revamped in a very big way. Uh, there are introduction of robots, artificial intelligence, machine learning in health centers. Robots have been designed already in to deliver uh, medicines, meals, to collect uh, uh, bed sheets and rubbish in hospitals. E-commerce giants, um, we are, they have developed drone program to drop parcels and to spray disinfectants we have seen. Uh, smart helmets have come up for identifying anyone with fever with, uh, within a say, uh, 5 meter radius. Amazon's just walk out technology, they have combined computer vision and AI very perfectly to or very efficiently to build customers directly as they walk out of the store. Uh, and no checkout, no billing counter, etc. required for that. So, so this uh, this is basically these are the ways where you can modernize the healthcare ambulatory service is very important because we have seen that every patient cannot be treated in hospitals. We require a strong ambulatory service for this. Nursing service needs to be strengthened. Telemedicine and mobile, mob, um, IoT based health delivery system needs to be improved a lot. And this is actually going to, uh, in, I mean, in a very big way, uh, coming up in a very big way in the coming years. 
And now there is the drug repurposing. We have seen that whatever drugs are coming out for fighting this virus, it was used for some other disease or something. So there is a scope of lot, lot of the drug repurposing where actually the uh, people can put in their brains and innovate uh, new things, new programs and all. So, so in in the manufacturing and supply chain, I will not go into details because uh, uh, there are other. Uh, uh, speakers for that uh, who are very expert in this field. So um, the blockchain, the robotic sensors and automation, uh, IoT enabled ventilators which are important now. You can have even you can try to build personal level in, uh, ventilators which people can carry at their home which are IoT enabled and which can be operated by doctors from a distance uh, so that the patient can be saved or can be supported. Uh, you have food processing which will come up in a very very big way, the refrigeration and storage particularly and the cryogenic process, that's a cryogenic way, I mean that, that, that's actually gaining very a uh, lot of uh, attention nowadays and the transportation part. And uh, when it comes to the sustainable energy system, here we see that uh, there is lot of scope uh, in areas where actually people have, people uh, I mean, are doing a lot of basic research, it's true, but not in the product level. The sustainable energy sources, more and more integration of them uh, into existing power networks, that needs to be looked into because um, our, that will be looked into actually in the future uh, to save the country from the, uh, the carbon uh, poison. Uh, then you have grid scale energy storage devices. Grid scale, I mean, small devices are also there. The existing technologies are there, like, say, electrochemical energy storage, like lead acid battery, lithium ion battery, vanadium redox battery, zinc brom uh, bromine, say, sodium sulfur, so many things are there. Then you have physical energy storage, like pump hydro, compressed air, fly, flywheel. Then you have electromagnetic energy storage, like supercapacitor, superconducting magnet, and you have other types, like advanced lead acid battery, lithium sulfur, sodium ion battery say heat pumps, uh, you have gravity energy storage. Now more have, has, has to come up because this alternative to lithium and lithium and battery is gaining a lot of popularity which actually will be a threat later on because source of lithium is, is an issue, safety of lithium is also an issue. So the smart, uh, I mean uh, any some other smart battery system has to come up after lead acid battery which has lived long. Uh, then you require smart grids, really now two way because we have seen you even during COVID that taking the uh, electricity or meter readings during uh, the ongoing lockdown period was a challenge to the utilities. And they used to, I mean many of the utilities have, we have seen that they used to uh, bill you at the, at the rate which was uh, billed during the same month last year. But uh, this should not be the way if you have installed smart grids in, your, uh, in all the homes and other places, uh, business houses. Uh, so then uh, you, you know the uh, meter reading from your office so it, the life becomes easier. Then the biomass to energy generation and waste to energy generation. Now as I told waste will be generated in a much bigger uh, volume. So from there to waste uh, to energy generation or in generation in some other forms of chemicals is very important. Biomass is <coughs> a big uh, uh, source of biomass in our country. From there to energy uh, convert generation or some other fuel uh, will also come up and uh, will have to come up actually uh, during this time. And the last one is very important, the application of renewable energy for desalination of water. The next crisis in the world I am sure is going to come in drinking water. And desalination process, whatever exists in the world today is not really very environmental friendly because it involves a lot of heat energy uh, and a lot of waste uh, salt to be thrown into the sea water thereby making the salinity of the sea totally uh, heterogeneous and it's very difficult for the for the uh, sea animals and the plants to survive under such situation. So some innovation is required when it comes to, uh, I mean the renewable, uh, renewable energies of different sorts needs to be applied uh, when it comes to desal desalination process. Uh, and. Um, Soil disposal issues also have to be seriously looked into and the solutions need to be thought. So here lots of scopes of innovations are there. 
Now, whatever we have seen till now, we have seen that most of them are digital in nature. So, for example, digital education. Now, we are worried that whether it will replace all institutes of higher learning. It, it can it can do one day because uh, the way uh, uh, everything is going online, the books are online, the papers are online, the journals are online, our lectures are online. So, so what is the need of uh, human uh, cohesion, uh, student cohesion in different um, institutes, which we actually enjoyed in our childhood days. But I, we really do not know whether the, the institutes or the education is totally going digital or not. So, so uh, whether all the institutes will get replaced or not, that is a big question. Then you have smart grid, again application of IoT. You have smart agriculture using you know, drones for spraying uh, insecticides, uh, manures, I mean so many things. Supply chain, uh, drones I have already told and of course the robots. Now experience with this digital platforms of learning, entertainment uh, as we have already seen many uh, even artists try to deliver their uh, performance during this lockdown period through digital platforms and the consumption will shape consumer attitudes towards digital and physical experiences. Now, these differences in consumer preferences may generate valuable business opportunities. Now, the demand for the for this digital product will intensify automation and digitization investments and generate new products, services and business models. In certain cases, we will see that disruptive innovations may also evolve which will render the existing machineries, the existing business models or existing skills totally obsolete and ultimately it will go to sustainable level once uh, in the future. Again, some market segments uh, will be quite ready to pay a premium for uh, high quality and safe physical consumption. Now, in this competition or in these cases, Competition will in, uh, evolve in enhancing and differentiating physical offerings with the remote and digital alternatives that have emerged. A greater use of AI and ML and automation will have tremendous bearing on the regulatory and liability system. They will also reduce employment by large. Use of disease screening and tracking, uh, the physical movement of the people will also have some serious implications on privacy and data protection. So, lots of complications will come along with this. Uh, digital technologies. Now, as the world emerges from crisis, employees will find new ways to interact, entrepreneurs will realize previously untenable business opportunities, managers can reassess innovation strategies, consumers will be able to take advantage of this new environment and policy regulation will adapt to keep everyone safer in the future. With foresight, the results of these innovations may also support solutions for climate change mitigation. We already the, the, the travel requirements have been diminished and the virtual work infrastructure is expanding. So, uh, you know, the, the use of gasoline is also going down and uh, we have we should expect a cleaner climate uh, soon. The risk assessment and emergence responses is in hazardous uh, uh, environments and uh, large scale biosafety, allowing our economic infrastructure to grow stronger as it overcomes these challenging times. And uh, when it comes, but again, something needs to be done on basic research aspect. Uh, now, this, these are the areas where actually a lot of focus, a lot of money can be given by different organizations and government, life sciences, the biotechnology, data science, and cyber security is the next big threat, two big threats we can foresee um, uh, in the globe. One is the cyber security, and another is lack of drinking water. Of course, virus and new virus can always come, but this surely will come very soon. AI and ML, new materials for energy generation and storage, waste treatment and recovery. Here, other than uh, your entrepreneurship, you need to give. We need to give a lot of focus on the basic research part. And but whatever we do, whatever we have discussed till now, uh, are for the people who are learning the students who can act in future uh, on these technologies, who can develop these technologies, who can transform these technologies into products. But what will happen 
to the people with formal education and people with no formal education who have who are unemployed or who have lost their employment what will happen to the growing unemployment due to digitization what will happen to the mental health issues of these unemployed people what will happen to the cyber security which is a biggest one of the biggest threats it will be network access and energy access which many people don't have basically so for them uh, i mean all these products will fall flat unless we get we try to give, give them the access and the biological and plastic waste, waste management so this will be the uh, huge concerns for india in the future and people or the students or the, or the future generation will definitely develop either a either solid products or service products on this to take care of the entire country uh, thank you okay uh, good evening uh, viewers uh, uh, the session is open for question answer now i have uh, got some of the questions before itself uh, through the uh, google form that has been distributed so the first uh, i will take those questions after that if you have something or if time permits we can continue one is that uh, how can a product be tested on a specific audience or customer before launching it on a large scale now on this uh, my take is that uh, uh, i mean that is the that is the reason for uh, why uh, the government of india is also uh, pushing for uh, 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 this uh, partnership and uh, hand holding i mean if the entrepreneurs who are developing the pro uh, product if uh, some you know faculties or scientists from any lab or educational institution they hand hold them that those things can be tested in the laboratory when it is in the development stage but before it is launched in the market that it has to go through uh, testing through some certifying uh, authority uh, a lot of uh, certification authorities for different types of products are there already in the country and uh, people should go to them for taking the final certificate before it is launched in the market as for corporate sectors and all they also can uh, uh, collaborate with the academic institutes to when on the development phase and later on uh, again some certifying authority has to be roped in to uh, have the results uh, uh, verified and uh, before it goes uh, or before it is certified for launch now uh, the the second question the second question is uh, just a minute uh, uh, why should i start a company to be more rich or to serve people this is a very pertinent question which people ask i mean if your uh, goal is to become rich it will be very difficult for you to become rich this uh, you can uh, take it from me uh, your initial purpose will also will only be to serve people and to support your own livelihood and in the process if the product survives uh, you can of course become rich at a later stage so serving the people and uh, just supporting your livelihood should be the only uh, only motive of your uh, startups but uh, and subsequently whatever happens uh, we should do our work but uh, we should uh, leave the future to decide what happens on, uh, on, the, on the monetary part so uh, uh, the next one uh, in today's world if we want to innovate in mobile phone then what we have to take in concern for a new generation of technology to take in concern for i mean it is okay typical but uh, uh, i i think that uh, the main thing uh, should be the data security part nothing else if you want to develop there will be small changes here and there the one of the major changes since they're based in china they have uh, tremendous acumen for making uh, things cheaper which is which actually it will be very difficult to conceive that how they do it if you just some of the some of the uh, you know 
individual prices of the parts used in many of the products not in mobile phone but in many of the products it will be difficult for you to conceive that how they can sell at a such a lower price but uh, uh, but you know the the the, the technology where you can uh, or the place where you can actually surpass them or crack their uh, their part or their claim is should be the cyber security part i mean that will be uh, that will become very important in the coming days as i was telling how to create general product and how to implement a useful product is known so okay uh, so this i think uh, it has been covered uh, i think uh, the house of quality and other parts what we have told of course i mean this this is a small lecture it's difficult to cover the product development part is a major part actually is a, a one whole semester course but uh, if it can be taken i think people generally will should get an idea of uh, the systematic way of developing a product taking into uh, 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 consideration the quality from the first day uh, what should be the strategy of state and state and central governments and citizen about any corona type damages what should be the strategy strategy means uh, now we have learned that what we have and what we don't have to fight these types of diseases so what we do not have uh, we should develop those things today it is corona tomorrow again something else can happen because see you see amphan has uh, uh, happened uh, it has struck uh, the eastern part of the country uh, very and people have really suffered very badly uh, and uh, during this corona itself you know, the, all the governments the governments were not really ready to fight that out so so this na uh, you know uh, nat natural disaster Uh, these types of viral attack cyber security which are the pertinent threats for any country uh, i think the state governments and central governments should be aware of and should take or should the, at least go for developing the infrastructure to take care of this situation infrastructure development is very very uh, uh, important that's why i was uh, talking about the primary and the uh, uh, health center developments i was talking about Uh, you know, modernizing the hospitals. That is basically for the corona type of damages. Uh, for other type of damages, of course, we have uh, we have to take resort to other uh, <coughs> activities. So, uh, uh, okay. Now, don't we have regulatory body in India for manufacture of PPE? This is a good question. Yes, we have BASI standards, but. Uh, uh, the problem is not the regulatory body you see that uh, i am i'm just talking uh, uh, in general perspective i don't know uh, this is a question from just i don't know where you, you stay but uh, in many parts of the country now you'll be seeing people who are selling uh, masks face masks free i mean at very low cost you will be you'll be finding them everywhere and people particularly poor people who cannot afford to buy uh n95 and higher grades of masks which are recommended people are generally going for that now what is the regulatory when are they going through in the regulatory body in india whether it is there or not so so implementation is the may is also one of the major reasons uh, for failure of uh, such type i mean of quality in our country and this is not true in i mean health product is dangerous because uh, we i mean it, it is uh, it, uh, it is a between life and death of people but for ma many of the products we see that the quality which we get or which we get to use is of much lower compared to what is expected or whatever is uh, recommended by the bsi standards because the, uh, the regulation authority uh, i mean it cannot be implemented in this huge country in this huge population so that is where that has to be made very strict and that will come through entrepreneurship people if they if they start making this uh, masks and all at large numbers get uh, this uh, certification from the board and uh, they, their selling point will be that that uh, that we are certified we are being given certificates for selling which others are not then i think uh, there is a scope that uh, things might uh, i mean when go in the right direction uh how can one maintain or provide a cheap and effective healthcare system to country like india where half half of the citizens are 
our lips okay lips in rural areas uh, this that that's why i was talking of the primary health centers which is supposed to function in rural uh, areas and that should be the epicenters from where uh, the actual uh, treatment has to start the isolation and other things uh, will be initiated from there it should not come up to the major hospitals and they should be left to doing specialized treatments so that is not impossible that is quite possible because we have also uh, uh, developed the panchayat uh, system in our country very efficiently only the the this system should be implemented and the panchayat should be uh, taken into confidence along with the local people that's why you know, in my presentation we'll be seeing that i have pressed upon employing local people whether it's nurses or doctors they should be localized so that they get interested in this in this work they need not uh, waste their time in traveling and all those things so if those people can be involved in uh, this uh, healthcare activity or healthcare system in our country in the remote villages then i mean if you if you tell uh, a doctor staying in the, in the uh say uh, city major city to go to rural areas and serve i mean he might go initially and but will might be get disinterested uh, very soon so that's why the local involvement is very very important and then only i think it is it will be sustainable so basic education uh, is also important that's why in the in the villages nurses and uh, doctors in good numbers also should emerge from these places otherwise the system will fail it's actually a lot of things have been involved to make this type of structures uh, work uh, how one can maintain or provide a chief okay okay this is done uh, okay i think there are not no major questions for this uh there are no major questions for this uh do uh, is anybody having any question online any questions online Okay thank you thank you